welcome to Human Design Catalyst, February 13th, 2023. I'm your host, Jonah Sage Dempsey. Uh, very cool, snowy day today. Check out uh, what's going on out there. And I'm here at Fasciation Space, which those of you who come to the uh, High Desert Human Design event will know. Um, this is where we host some of our events. This is the uh, retail space of Michael Steenbeck Litman. So thank you, Mike, for allowing us to host here. It's, um, it's always really nice. And yeah, it's the night before Valentine's Day. So we thought we would do a little uh, talk on the streams of sexuality. And this is a really interesting topic um, that I, I really enjoy because I have a completely open solar plexus. So <laughs> it's something that I guess I'm... Uh, especially suited to to kind of know about or at least um, at least experience become wise about yay come on in. <laughs> perfect timing this is ivy fallon just gonna join that for a second hey um we're not live or anything but, it will be on YouTube later. but you can sit on this side if you'd like to see the presentation <laughs> That was, that was amazing. That was like a movie sound That was, yeah, that was, we can sample that. That's yeah. like, that's a dinosaur. Right? No, that's, I thought so. so. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So. Wherever you want to be. I, my, my goal is to see the screen and yeah. not be in the shot. So I'm okay, the I'm going to just, uh, yeah. And um, I'm actually going to add a little audio filter to get the audio a little bit um a little bit better, and yep, there we go. The audio should be a little bit uh, louder now. So. Okay, so I'm really excited um, to be doing the streams of sexuality. And um, the streams of sexuality go through the solar plexus. And so we're gonna be talking a lot about the solar plexus. What I was just saying is I have a completely undefined solar plexus. So I this is where I go to school. This is where I've had the most to learn. You know, this is where I can really take in the other, and I can take in the other very cleanly, um, or I can take in the other with a lot of amplification, you know. It's also where I feel the transits the most, and of course generators and projectors primarily get conditioning from each other and from manifestors and reflectors as opposed to the transits. Manifestors and reflectors are kind of transit first, but I'll tell you, that 35-36 we've had going on, um, I can definitely Definitely felt it. We've had Mars in 35 and Neptune in 36. Um, and then I also have a hanging 12 and we've had Venus in 22. So it's been double barrel solar plexus action lately. And we'll be talking about those channels because those are both in the streams of sexuality. So the, the three streams, the tribal sexual stream, this is 1949 going into 3740. So all of the streams start at the root, and we can see that the tribal ends in the ego, whereas the individual and collective end in the throat. The individual sexual stream goes from 3955 up to 1222, ending in the throat, and 12. And uh, I guess that should say 2212. And then the collective sexual stream is 4130, 3635. So it ends in... Uh, the voice of feelings in the throat. So these, these streams are really the root pressure for sexuality. This is a genetic imperative. We need to produce more. You know, we need more babies in the world or we go extinct. And the root is what fuels the different processes, all of the processes. And on the left side of the root, we have the splenic processes where the root is essentially fueling the processes for caring. And on the right, we have it fueling the processes um, for sexuality, for sexual bonding. Uh, now, when I say sexuality, I'm including sexuality that might not look like sexuality. I mean, it's all kinds of sexuality. For instance, tribal sexuality is like that old couple that, you know, has the pat on the shoulder or holding hands when they're walking or, you know, stuff like that. Individual sexuality can be unrequited love. It can be writing poems to each other. It can be writing letters. Um, sexuality can include a lot. And I would say collective sexuality probably has the widest variety, particularly in the 36, 35. Um, gate 36 is really there to kind of have the widest variety of sexuality in that sense. Although when we get into unusual sexuality, that's typically individual. So you, you'll see as we go through this journey that um, 
sexuality in, in humans is quite vast. For those of you who've seen the television show Bored to Death, they love the main character, uh, Jason Schwartzman's character. He, he, uh, he meets, you know, he's a detective. He's like a private detective who kind of gets into all different situations. And in one of them, he ends up in a BDSM dungeon and he ends up meeting a police officer who's, you know, into some of the stuff. And the guy's kind of embarrassed. And Jason Schwartzman character just says, oh, I've always considered myself a student of, I've always considered myself a student of human sexuality. And he kind of says that to make the guy feel better. But I think that's true for anyone with an undefined solar plexus. You're really here to be a student uh, of sexuality. You know, that's where you go to school. Um, people who have a defined solar plexus, it's a little bit different. Um, we're all sexual beings, but um, the defined solar plexus sort of emits that their brand of sexuality in some sense. So let's start with, uh, well, we can just talk about sexuality is in the solar plexus. There are seven gates in the solar plexus, and along with their harmonics, this makes 14 gates of sexuality. Um, the 659 is part of the defense circuit, and so they are sexual gates, uh, but we won't really be talking about the 659 other than to say, you know, this is, the six is like what determines who's let in and who isn't. It's the pH balance of the body. And the 59 is there to be a sort of sexual hustler, to try to get in, to try to break down the aura. When you have them together, actually, we call that the aura cutters. I kind of actually one of its, one of its nicknames, um, this channel of, of intimacy. And, um, and so in any case, yeah, 59 is the friction, the friction that can lead uh, to orgasm. Or, and, and then six is the, what we call it, dispersal, mm -hmm. dispersion. So in any case, um, we have, uh, we have sexuality in the 659, but it's not part of the sexual streams that we're going to be talking about. It's part of the defense circuit, um, and that is a very interesting, we talked about it a little bit last week, it's a very interesting uh, aspect. I'll just say that my favorite way to think of it is the 659 is there to make sure that the population can be repopulated in a desert island situation. So it's really there to sort of um, make sure that you're not too picky. Like, yeah, the six can be picky, but it's really picky among the suitors. It's not meant to be picky for no good reason, so to speak. It's meant to be picky among the suitors in the sense that if there's only one suitor, if you're on a desert island, then, you know, that's, that's what you get. And it's there to kind of make sure you can break down the barriers to intimacy that allow for sexual bonding to occur. My joke is kind of, if you look at the other side of it, the 5027, channel of preservation, which is all about uh, raising children. Well, I mean, that's minimum seven years. The human can't survive if it hasn't been cared for for less than seven years. But really, in practice, it's more like 18 years. And this 18 years of caring, think about how different that is from selecting a mate, selecting a potential mate, or really a sexual partner. Um, you know, I guess it's also called channel of mating, right? Um, when you're picking a sexual partner, you don't take 18 years to do it. But when you're raising kids, you do, right? You take 18 years to raise the kid, 18 years of caring. What are they wearing? What are they eating? You know, when do they go to sleep? What do they do? All this stuff. And so it's really, it's so funny to reverse those and to imagine that there's an 18-year vetting process to decide whether or not to have sex compared to, you know, oh, you have the kid and you just drop them off somewhere. No, it's, it's not like that. I mean, they, it is sometimes in the case of adoption, but really the 5027 is there to raise children and the 659 is there to make children. Uh, and they're quite different things and they have different requirements. The 659's requirement is that it can break through the barriers. But in any case, besides the 659, the other 12 gates are in the streams of sexuality. And so those are the gates that, that we're going to be looking at. Then we start with tribal sexuality. This is called ego sex. You know, this is controlled touch. This is, um, you know, the right touch, not the wrong touch. This is, you can touch me, but you can't touch him, or you can't touch her. You know, you can touch them, but you can't. This is really about, um, you know, everything in the tribe is about support and need. These are the big keynotes of the tribe. So. This is sexuality that's there for the support of getting needs met and for the need to be supported, to be supported in, process, in your process and to have supportive people in your life. I mean, this is glue. This is the glue that keeps people together. 
Um, so one interesting point, as long as one person has a tribal channel in the sexual stream, or they, the two people have an electromagnetic in the sexual stream, this tribal sexuality will be activated for that. I mean, even the long-term transit can make it a very tribal relationship. It's just a tribal relationship that falls apart when the transit ends. Mm -hmm. You see that a lot in the case of split definitions, where the split definition person, um, you know, the other person doesn't bridge their split, but there was a, a bridge in, uh, in the transits. Or two people who aren't split definition, but they have a split composite, and then the transits were bridging the split, and then as soon as the transit ends, the relationship falls apart. So in any case, when you're looking at the sexuality here, either you have one of these channels, in which case every single one of your relationships will bear this mark, because you bring it to the table. It doesn't matter if the other person doesn't have it. You know, you only enter into tribal relationships. That is, if you have the 1949 or the 3740, all of your relationships are tribal. Now, if you have one of those gates but not the other, or two of those gates but not the other two, um, in which case, you know, you don't have a channel there, then you're going to be in tribal relationships when the other person has a tribal sexuality gate, or when the other person uh, has an electromagnetic with you that creates that channel. But in any case, this is all about when that channel um, is in the composite, and what it's going to do is it's going to basically add an obligation for this life force energy that that obligation is going to be you have to support each other. You have to be loyal to each other. And you know, tribal loyalty is like mob loyalty. It's loyalty no matter what. It's loyalty if the other person goes to jail. It's loyalty if, I mean, the relationship is over when the loyalty is broken. The, the, the loyalty keeps the relationship together. And it's not saying you have to be loyal. I mean, um, Certainly people aren't, but it's saying that the relationship depends on that and that that life force energy is about trust and it's about, it's ultimately, it, it ends up in the ego. It ends up in the ego, so it's about ego things. It's about possessiveness. It's about um, control. So much of the ego is about control. Controlled touch. Controlled sexuality. I love what Alok was saying. I was recently at you know, Alok's retreat in Costa Rica, the uh, Puerto Vida retreat on by Chaitanya FX with you know, Lokanand Diaz, and he was talking about tribal sexuality, and he was saying um, that in terms of the control, it's really, uh, you know, you look at a 3740, and this is, the, this is the kiss on the cheek on your birthday, or the kiss on your forehead tucking you into bed. But this is not free sexuality. Even even the, the kind of platonic sexuality of a family member, it's very controlled. And, you know, among friends, it's very controlled. In Italy or in Spain, you might kiss each other on the cheeks, but it's very controlled in that way. You don't keep kissing after that. Uh, you might hug someone, you know, but you don't hug too long. It's controlled hugging. It's, uh, if you have the, that, you know, 3740, we have a friend who's a uh, 3740 who controls what side you hug on. She'll only hug on one side, you know. This is controlled touch in every sense of the term. Uh, but just because it's so controlled doesn't mean that they're not, you know, thinking about all sorts of other things. The uh, 1949 is the bride and the groom, and the 3740 is the marriage contract. And so we really have marriage in this stream. We have the bride and the groom who look into each other's eyes, you know, and, and who are really... It's, it's really, it is, this is also where we get mysticism, and you can see something so mystical about, about marriage and about how in, in the olden days it was closely related to, um, well, the, this is where taboos come from, right? And it was closely related to, like, if you read in um, Totem and Taboo by Freud, or if you read in Fraser's Golden Bow, this is about um, marrying between different families or between different tribes, you can't marry within your tribe. You can't marry someone with the same totem. You can't marry, this is the, the incest taboo. All of this kind of starts in the 1949 and is part of the bargain of the 3740. And it's really the foundation that, um, of society as we know it now. And so we see the keynotes of the tribe. And uh, you could think of these as sort of the exaltations and the detriments, the, the two sides of it. And, uh, you know, as much as we say that one is not good and the other is not bad, it's, it's pretty obvious that the not-self gets the detriments in that, or at least the not-self gets, 
it, it you know it gets the the bad side of the bargain a lot of the time like like when we end up in the not self and when we're a generator but we're constantly initiating we're not obeying our um, tribal obligations we end up with the ignore divorce betray and hate and you know because it, but obviously even when we are following our strategy and authority it may end up that way when the intimacy has run its course because all intimacy has a shelf life so you can have the best relationship in the world that has not run out of shelf life that is still fresh and still wonderful and you can be in the obey marry honor love kind of sequence and then you can totally screw it up through the not self and end up in the ignore divorce betray and hate and that causes quite a bit of resistance um, at the same time you can also be living out the obey, marry, honor, love, and that relationship can run its course, and maybe you're a projector and you're invited into something else, or you're invited to leave the relationship, maybe you're a generator and you respond to something else, um, maybe you're a manifester and you initiate the break, or you're a reflector and you simply realize that that relationship has run its course. That may generate a certain amount of ignore, divorce, betray, hate. I mean, it might. So it's not that these keynotes can always be seen as when you're living your design or not. However, what I've noticed is that people who are living their design tend to get the good keynotes, but they don't get them by wanting them and by being hooked on them and by being obsessed with them. They get them by surrendering. And so it's almost like you get what you wanted anyway, but it's only by surrendering. Because really when you surrender, you get what you need and you adjust what you want so that you want what you need, no longer wanting what you don't need, so to speak because those are the not self desires. The not self desires are for things that we don't really want. But in any case, if you have 1949, you need a certain amount of obeying and marrying in some sense. Otherwise, you're gonna get the ignoring and divorcing, it's not gonna feel good. You don't wanna be ignored. You don't wanna be divorced. It's, it, you'll be bitter. I mean, this is the success or the bitterness. 1949 is successful when people obey and marry. 3740 is successful when they honor and love. And it's bitter as hell when they betray and hate. It doesn't want to have to hate. It really doesn't want to. Now, um, it's interesting to see that in each one of these streams of sexuality, we're going to see where love is. And here, love is in the ego. For the individual, love is in the solar plexus. And for the collective, love is in the root. How is that? How interesting is that? So we really have these sequences of keynotes that tell a story. And they tell the story of the couple who comes together and they obey, they don't look at other people, you know, controlled touch, controlled sexuality, they marry, they honor each other, and they carry themselves with honor. And out of that comes love. The love is the end result. It's the fruition of obeying, marrying, and honoring. But if they can't do that, and if they end up ignoring and divorcing and betraying, they're going to end up hating. They're going to end up hating. The voicelessness of ego sex. This is... Um, Ra's keynotes here, I always kind of saying, you are mine or not, because I can touch you at will or not. At will, the willpower of the ego, right? Interesting, interesting. This is not rational, it's the stomach. Certain things you can't swallow, it's the limit, you can't stomach it. That is how Alokanon Diaz explains tribal sexuality. And it's good to remember that, you know, it, this, this is related to the heart and the stomach, and it's related to having the needs met and food and eating and all of this. I mean, eating is in all of the solar plexus, not just tribal, but this is like 1949 is kind of where we get butchery and the dividing of um, the good cuts of meat. And 3740 is like, well, 40 is the breadwinner who delivers, you know. They, 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 it's called deliverance, and it's because they deliver the goods, they provide for the family, they bring back food for the family. And if they've betrayed the bond and they're not delivering food to the family, and there are you know, certain things you just can't stomach, and you can't swallow. I mean, it is kind of these, these eating metaphors are very relevant here. They really are. Any comments on tribal sexuality? No. Comment on tribal? Okay. So individual sexuality, it's so different. We've moved from the sexuality of touch and of smell and of I like your smell and I like how you touch me and, and you know now you obey me and you don't look at anyone else, you don't even think of anyone else. That's this whole tribal thing. Now we're in the emotional sexuality of the individual. 
And so the individual is really here, it's almost like sex for the sake of emotion, sex for the sake of the emotional uh, savoring of a certain rarefied emotional scent or an, an aroma. It's like, it's this um, kind of like what Jung said, uh, you know, he had for 30 years, he had his wife, Emma, and he also had his mistress, Tony, Tony Wolf. And when they both died within a year or two of each other, he said, Tony was my scent of life, but Emma was my foundation. And you can see the loyalty of the foundation of the tribal compared to um, the aroma of life, of that individual passion and excitement. And don't confuse them, by the way. I mean, sometimes you have relationships that have both, but sometimes you will end up in a situation like you know, where you have one with one person and one with someone else. And they're quite different. They're quite different from each other. But in any case, you know, individual sexuality, this is where we get unrequited love. This is where we get love letters and poetry, 1222, that channel of openness. It's where we get, um, in that 3955, where the 55 is eternally indecisive love. That's the love gate here. The 55 is the love gate. It's in the solar plexus. So this is the, where, where the, the love is in the emotional system. It's not the love of ego. It's not the love of control or of, of possession or the love of um, having provided resources or having one's needs met or the love of being supported. That's what tribal loves. They love that they're supported. They love that their needs are met. Individual loves the feeling until they don't because the individual is on a pulse and it can't, it doesn't have the staying power. It pulses on and it pulses off. And in fact, those familiar with gate 55 will know that it actually has four states. It knows or not whether it's in love or not. I know I'm in love with you. Well, that changes to, I don't know if I'm in love with you anymore. And then that changes to, I know I'm not in love with you. But then it changes to, I don't know if I'm not in love with you anymore. Maybe I will be in love with you again. This is eternally indecisive love. And we see the keynotes. Starting in the root, we have live, love, laugh, and happy. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, these 1222 are uh, reversed here. This should be, uh, oops. Um, here, let me just quickly uh, correct that. That would be, um, there we go. Sorry about that. <laughs> just gonna correct it right now. So that way, while I continue talking about it, it will be fixed. Okay. I have a question also. Yes, what is the question? Um, so uh, it's also the love of the spirit. 55. And what do they mean by the spirit, and is that different than the G center spirit? Oh, that's a great question. No, I think it is the same spirit, and I think it just shows how, um, you know, 25 is one of these spiritual gates, or I guess all the G center gates are kind of spiritual, but that um, 55 also has. It's really, um, it shows the deep connection. It's like where the spirit is, it's like the spiritual representative in the emotional. And um, I actually have some really good, uh, a couple of good quotes about that that could go into it in more detail. But, but I do see it as um, the enthusiasm and basically if that 55 is, is, if it's hating, if it's not loving, if it's hating its life, if it's hating being stuck with someone, if it's hating being in a relationship that's not going to be it, or if it's hating because it wants to be in a relationship and it can't, and it hates its life because it can't be with the person it wants, that is the spirit dying. That is crushing the spirit. And it's, it's kind of like where the G-Center gets, it's like, it's like the, you know, because the G-Center is the center of love and there's love gates all over the place. And so these are almost like the fingers of the G-Center in the other centers the tendrils of the G-Center in the other centers. Because you can have all that purpose and all that determination and all that, you know, in the G-Center, but your spirit will be dying inside if that 55 is, is really in its hate mode. You know, it's, it's meant to love. And, and when it does love, um, yeah, it is able to, to embolden the spirit and so on. And, you know, it's, it's enthusiasm. Enthusiasm, the root of that word is theos, God. And it's the God within. Entheos. That's where we also get entheogen, for mm -hmm. instance, is a term for uh, like a drug that kind of allows you to access the God within. An entheogen. 
a lot of psychedelics are called entheogens, for instance. But, um, but enthusiasm is the same root there, and it has to do with accessing the God within. This is the spirit, and you know, um, can you be enthusiastic or not? And it's, I know I can be enthusiastic, or I don't know if I can be enthusiastic, or I know I can't be enthusiastic here, or I don't know if I can be enthusiastic. It's kind of another way of looking at it. But we have the keynotes, live, love, laugh, and happy it results in the happiness. Die, hate, cry, sad. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, right? Right? And it's funny here because I remember when I first was reading the Human Science Sexuality Manual, and I was kind of shocked by this because I was, um, well, you know, I have tw 12 and I don't have 22, and so anytime somebody comes along with a 22 and activates me, Ra was saying the same thing. He had 12 and didn't have 22. And he also had an undefined solar plexus. And he was saying, well, you know, before human design, I was really always a sucker for those 22s. They would come along and then I would, uh, he actually said he had two kids because of the moon. <laughs> because the moon went along and activated, you know, his 22 or something, right? And, uh, and he made an emotional decision in the moment. And, uh, and in any case, uh, I remember I was reading this and I was thinking, you know, each of these has a different yardstick for how it judges if the relationship is good or bad. And really, the only valid yardstick is your strategy and authority of whether you should stay in that relationship or whether it's lived out its life or, you know, because every relationship has a lifespan. Some of them last a day, some of them last a lifetime. You don't really get to choose how long the lifespan of the relationship is. All you can do is be observant. And so what, what he was saying about the yardsticks, and I think the tribal yardstick was probably um, if they're loyal or not, or if you end up uh, being supported, having your needs met. And, the collective is kind of if it's exciting or not and stuff like that. But the individual is if you're happy or sad. And I was thinking, what a fragile yardstick. You know, I'm sad, therefore this whole relationship is bad. I'm sad, therefore we should break up. I'm sad, therefore this was a mistake. I'm sad, therefore it's over. Wait, I'm happy, therefore let's stay together. <laughs> I'm happy, therefore it must be good. You know, like what a <laughs> fragile yardstick for a relationship, and yet this is how individuality works. You either live and you feel that surge of life, that, you know, I mean, it's funny to think of 39's keynote as living, you know, what life is provocation, I guess, really. And then you, you love and you laugh together and then you're happy or else you die inside, you hate that you can't be with the person or that you can't leave the person or that whatever it is, you cry and then you're sad. And that's that's the, the bad side of it. And uh, the voice of emotional sex. This is a really interesting one. So these lines, alone, selective, limited, strange, cautious, and different. So I'm going to go through, I'm going to say it six times. It really is even 12 if we're going to do the happy or sad. So I am happy because I am alone. I am alone sexually and that makes me happy. I am sad because I am alone. I mean, we've heard these, right? I am happy because I'm selective sexually. I'm so selective with who comes to me, it makes me really happy. I am sad because I'm so selective. I can't meet anyone, right? You can see how they go both ways. That's the second line. We go to the third line. I am happy because I am limited sexually. I don't want anything else. This is my limited sexuality. I am sad because I'm limited sexually. I can't have the others have. I'm happy because I am strange sexually. I am sad because I am strange sexually. No one's gonna like that, right? I am happy because I am cautious sexually. I am sad because I am so cautious sexually. I see these others who aren't so cautious, and I'm sad I can't be like them. And I am happy because I am different sexually, or I am sad because I am different sexually. And you can see that the individual is never meant to compare themselves to anyone, because the sad side is typically because of comparison. And the happy side is typically because they're empowered in who they are. Interesting little side note there. To love an individual means to love and honor their individuality. Now that might seem simple, and this was a longer quote, but I cut it off here because I thought, we always think, oh, I love you, but do you really honor their individuality? Sure, tribal knows how to honor, but it doesn't necessarily know how to honor individuality. It doesn't know how to honor what makes them different. It doesn't know how to honor when they want to be alone. It doesn't know how to honor when they're strange. It doesn't know how to honor, you know what I mean? The, it's like individual, you know, it's honoring their strangeness, honoring their limitation, honoring their selectiveness, mm -hmm. honoring when they want to be alone, honoring, you know, those keynotes we were looking at from the previous slide. 
And then, you know, this is a great quote from Awok. It's not like they wouldn't like to stay. When you stay, you become attached. You become an asshole. You become an asshole, you hate yourself, so you go. <laughs> it's the only solution. And, you know, he's talking about individual there, but that also probably applies to the 36, 35, because one thing we've noticed is that, we can notice here is that the tribal doesn't have a manifestor channel. That means the tribal doesn't really get anger, angry. It only gets bitter. The tribal is 1949, projected. 3740, projected. Well, individual and collective can get mad as hell. They are anger channels. There's only four anger channels in the whole chart. And individual sexuality has one of them, the 2212. And collective sexuality has the other, the 3635. And anger and manifestor channels, I mean, they can also have peace, but oftentimes the peace is when they leave. You know, I'm leaving so I can have peace. I can't, I'll be angry if I stay, because they really are about separation. If we look at, um, like we started the whole thing with the 659, that's about coming together. That's the generator sexuality channel. The only generator sexuality channel, by the way, which is interesting to see that sexuality is Two parts anger, one part frustration, and four parts bitterness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Or two parts peace, one part satisfaction, and four parts success. Mm -hmm. Success of the, the genetic imperative succeeding in creating more, more bonding, more connection. So. Mm -hmm. And this brings us to collective sexuality, so called Kundalini sex. 4130, the channel of recognition, and then 3635, the channel of transitoriness. And the keynotes here are love, feel, enter, and leave, mm -hmm. or hate, burn, exit, and stay. <clears throat> so this is an interesting one. Love here is in the root, and it's the fantasy. Love, love is really in the fantasy of something new, something exciting, something different. And it can be either, you know, loving, loving that there's something new around the corner or hating the fact that you're stuck with nothing new. Or it can be, you know, loving that there's some, loving that you have the fantasy and that's enough or hating that you only have the fantasy, nothing more. Um, it can be loving that the fantasy leads you into something more or hating that what it led you into robbed you of that fantasy and you no longer have it because it was ruined. But love is in the root. It's in fantasy. Uh, it's in your personality side. Or also hating that you have to go out there and have it for real. Maybe. Or, I mean, it could probably, there's so many variations. It could probably hate that you can't have it, that you're stuck at home and not, and you don't know what's over the, the hill in that big city you want to go to. Or hating that it's not enough, that you don't, that you're, it's pushing you to something more. I mean, but it can be enough. You can love that it is enough. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the fantasy is enough. Right? So, I mean, there's many ways that this can go. Um, and then the 30 is feeling or the, the burning, you know, getting burned, getting uh, too much feeling in a way. Um, and then you enter right, or you exit. And then you leave or you stay. And it's funny that the sort of negative side of this is sticking around in a situation you hate. You've already exited. There's no more entering. You've already left the relationship, but you're stuck in it somehow. And it burns. It burns you every single day because the feeling's not there anymore. All that's there is the burn of resistance. It's hard. We need fire. Yeah. And it says, you make me feel good or you make me feel bad because you reject or accept me. You inspire or bore me. You adore or ignore me. You try to satisfy or you can't satisfy me. You risk or you regret me. And you correct or compare me sexually. So let's look at a few of these. You make me feel good because you reject me. How funny is that? I've had that. I mean, anyone who's been in a relationship has felt good about being rejected at, you know, at a certain point. But they've also felt good about being accepted. You make me feel bad because you reject me. Well, that one. Yeah. Or you make me feel bad because you accept me. And, and, you know, I'm being kind of brought into this relationship, but I don't want to be in this kind of relationship. I'm stuck in it, trapped in it. I can't, you know, I've exited, but I'm staying. That's the worst, you know. I've entered, but I can leave. 
that's that's the heaven of that 3635. It wants to be able to enter. I mean, that can also be penetration, copulation, whatever. And it wants to be able to leave the next day. It doesn't want to be able to stick around, to have to stick around. It doesn't, it's not tribal. It doesn't want to be glued to the person for life. So it can feel really good being rejected, or it can feel really bad being accepted, because that means it's stuck. You make me feel good because you inspire me. You, know, you, you make me feel bad because you bore me. Now, these are the common ones, right? If, if it's bored, if it, you know, this is what craves excitement, craves new experience. But it can also feel really good to be bored with someone. I mean, I know it doesn't usually go that way. Um, in fact, I would almost say that reject and accept should be switched and that most of the time, 99% of the time, you're going to feel good because you're accepted and bad because you're rejected. Good because you're inspired and bad because you're bored. Good because you're adored, bad because you're ignored. And so on. But then once the relationship has run its course, it feels pretty good to be ignored by that person because then they're not stalking you or hounding you or bothering you in some way. See what I'm saying? It's kind of what side of the binary you're on in the relationship. When you want to be in that relationship, when you haven't been in it yet and you're excited to experience it, well, it feels really bad to be ignored by that person and you really want to be adored by them. But then, if say you have 35, 36 and you've had that sexual experience and you're ready to move on, you're ready to leave, well, it can feel pretty good to be ignored then. <laughs> But part of the good boredom, you know, with 35, classically, it's like having the space to relive the experience internally. And if you're constantly stimulated and having new stuff, your experiences don't get to settle and you don't get to really enjoy what's already up. That's a good point. At certain times, it's going to feel really good to have that space to be able to relive it and not just be pushed into something new. You make me feel good because you try to satisfy me. You make me feel bad because you can't satisfy me. I mean, these are generally how they work. You can mix and match them, but they, they generally follow. Uh, you know, you make me feel good because you're risking for me. You're taking a risk. It might not work, but you're risking it. You make me feel bad because you regret me. You regret me so much you won't even, you pretend it didn't happen, or something like that, you know. I feel really bad. You make me feel good because you correct me sexually. You tell me how I can improve. You make me feel bad because you compare me sexually. Wow, that can hurt. That can hurt. This is to feel someone, to feel their presence, to feel their energy. It can be very positive to feel that quality. It can be very exciting. There's the burning on the other side, this intensity. That's gate 30, right? Something to understand as well. If you have a relationship that gets rooted in this stream, it doesn't necessarily mean that it will work. Nobody says that this is going to be easy. 3635 is an electromagnetic that doesn't really like each other. It doesn't really work as an electro. That's something Rob said. Kind of like the 4521 and the 515. Those are the three electros that are problematic electromagnetics to have. Although, as long as you have a constant stream of new experiences, and you're going on vacation together, and you're having sex in new places, it's like, never have sex in the same place twice. Never have sex on the same surface twice. That's a quote from Rob from the 3536. Because as soon as you do, you start to exit the relationship, feel the burn, hate that you're stuck in it, and stick around. And that's really rough. All right. Thank you for uh, just a short one today. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming. It's all snowy out. Uh, snowy Santa Fe and uh, perfect timing. It looks like... Uh, we're about to go watch uh, a film. It should be really fun. We're going to go watch um, Clueless. Clueless, which I don't know what it really has to do with Valentine's, but it seems to be a Santa Fe Valentine's uh, tradition. So, yeah. Thanks for watching.